Okay, so Marvel just released a trailer for X-Men 97, its new animated TV show picking up right where X-Men the animated series left off in 1997. Basic naming conventions aside, this thing was chock full of easter eggs, comic references, and interesting storylines that the show might be using, and I'm gonna try my best to break down as many of them as I can right now. The trailer fittingly opens with an older TV playing a VHS copy of the last episode of X-Men the animated series, featuring Charles Xavier on his deathbed, basically being like, you guys got it now, I'm kicking off. And I think this is important because it shows that this is a continuation. And while X-Men the Animated Series was probably the most faithful adaptation to the comics we've ever had, surprisingly, it is still not a one-to-one -one and does have its own continuity and is its own established universe. And fittingly, the actual trailer opens up with a familiar sight. Callisto and Leech, two members of the Morlocks that appeared in the original series. Also, quick aside, Leech is one of the best characters in fiction. He's my precious little green boy and I'm so excited he made the cut, are once again hiding from the Sentinels. But then the very next sequence shows us that the people behind X-Men 97 are very interested in incorporating newer elements and aspects of the comics into this established universe. Because a Daily Bugle article flies by! Now, Spider-Man does actually cross over with the original X-Men the Animated Series cartoon, so the presence of the Bugle by itself is not necessarily noteworthy. What is interesting is the content, because it offers an inside scoop on a mutant fashion show, which is ostensibly a reference to Krakoa. Now for those who don't know, Krakoa was this little paradise island that all the mutants decided to go and live on, where nothing bad happened, except for all of the bad things that were constantly happening all of the time. And a big part of it was the Hellfire Gala, which was basically a mutant fashion show. All of your favorite X-Men would get new fashionable looks and they would just party the night away and devastatingly horrible things would only happen like one third of the time. Now, the Krakoan Age, as it was called, lasted from 2019 till right now. Comics are currently coming out that are detailing how this whole thing falls apart, so I would be very surprised if this is anything more than an easter egg. I do not think we're gonna get all the way to Krakoa in this season of X-Men 97, but I do think this article is supposed to suggest a shift in the status quo, because right after the original series went off the air, there was a big cultural shift in the way the X-Men were perceived, thanks mainly to the film that came out in the year 2000 and the relaunch of the comics under visionary author Grant Morrison called New X-Men in 2001. And a big aspect of both those works was taking the mutant from being a small handful in New York City to being a genuine global minority. And for New X-Men, that was represented by giving them a distinct and identifiable underground mutant culture like fashion shows. And I think that's what including this article is really supposed to convey, that in between X-Men the Animated Series and X-Men 97, the world of mutants in this universe has grown. And we can tell this because everybody in this picture, with the exception of Banshee, who was in the original show, is a character that wouldn't debut in the comics until after the original series was off the air. Real quickly, we can see Dust, an original character from New X-Men, Stacy X, a mutant sex worker who would first appear in 2001, and I have to assume this is a kid version of Maggot, a character who would first appear in 1997. Now notably, he does not have blue skin like Maggot, but he does have similar hair, similar glasses, and I think that is one of his maggots on his shoulder. Quick side note if you didn't know, Maggot is a character whose mutant power is that his digestive system are two living maggots that exist outside of him named Eenie and Meenie. X-Men are fun. And over there in the corner, it seems we have Nature Girl with the antlers, who first appeared in 2014, and Loa, a member of Academy X, who first appeared in 2004. But anyways, moving on from literally that one frame, the next thing we learn is that Xavier has in fact died. Or at least it seems like he did. This is taking from one of my favorite eras of Xavier in the comics, the fucked off to space Xavier, where he got very sick and decided that it was time for some quality R&R &R with his girlfriend who happened to be the leader of a space empire. Now that girlfriend, Lalandra, does appear in the original show, so it is possible that after being sick like we saw in the last episode of the original series and the beginning of this trailer, he does just fuck off to space. We see a coffin, but it might be a lie. But regardless, the man's not around, and that's where we get to what I think was going to be the main plot of this season, which pulls from a comic story called The Trial of Magneto. This is the first big shift in Magneto's character in the comics that takes him from being a pretty one-note villain to a much more complex sort of good guy. And it begins with the fleshing out of his backstory and the reveal that he is a Holocaust survivor. So when in battle with the X-Men, he thinks he's murdered Kitty Pride, who he then realizes is a young Jewish child, he he realizes that he has become everything that he personally hates. Flash forward a little bit later, he actually goes with Kitty to a Holocaust memorial where he is arrested, and rather than fight back and escape, he accepts it and goes to trial at The Hague for all of his crimes. And that is the trial we see replicated almost exactly in this trailer. Also just to note, the comic where this trial is physically happening is also the same one where Charles fucks off to space. Keep that in mind for later. From here we get a lot of different glamour shots of the X-Men team, as well as a blink and you'll miss it shot of what seems to be the 
the Savage Land, where both Magneto and Xavier are being lauded as heroes. I'm not sure how much the Savage Land will factor into this season. If I had to guess, there's going to be an episode where they have to save it from some wannabe ruler, maybe Sauron or Zaladane, because we do see a shot again later that shows the same place, but with fireworks, which kind of vibes revolution to me, so. But the more interesting thing is we finally see the whole team together in the Blackbird, and there are two things of note there. Number one, Bishop is with them. In the original series, Bishop was a time traveler from the future. He would pop in for essential storylines like Days of Future Past, but he never really stuck around. Though in this show, it seems like he's going to be a main cast member. And we know the show is picking up right where the last one ends, so it's not like they've caught up to his timeline. So the question is, why is he sticking around? That might be tied to the second interesting thing in this scene, which is that Jean is not with them. The most obvious reason for this could be that she's pregnant. Here's the thing though, there's no comic where Jean is pregnant. Now she has children. Sure, because comic timelines are wonky to say the least, but in regards to a long-term storyline, this is an original creation for the show, if they're really doing it. If I had to assume who she's pregnant with, I would have to guess it's Rachel Summers, her and Scott's daughter from the dystopic future of the Days of Future Past timeline. Now, Rachel does not show up in the original series, but since Bishop is such an integral part of this storyline in the original show, it's possible that the anomaly of her birth in this timeline is why he's sticking around. But it's also possible that this is not Jean. Because there is an X-Men character who very famously gets pregnant and gives birth in, you guessed it, the trial of Magneto, and that is Madeline Pryor. She, originally unbeknownst even to herself, is a clone of Jean Grey that Scott falls in love with and marries after Jean perishes in the Dark Phoenix Saga. And it is actually Madeline who is the mother to Scott's son and recurring character in the original series, Cable. Now, at the end of X-Men the Animated Series, Jean is not dead, so this would be a pretty massive switch up. And it's also possible that they're just streamlining the story and merging the characters and having Jean be the one who gives birth to Cable. But given that we know this show has a tie-in Funko Pop of the Goblin Queen, which is Madeline's alias, I would not write off the possibility for a big reveal just yet. Now, while that might be the most fascinating part of the trailer in terms of storytelling potential, the best part of the trailer comes a little bit later when Gambit charges Wolverine's claws. Listen, y'all know I'm a Gambit fan. I love the man. I don't even really give a shit that this is not how Gambit's power would actually work. And we know that because one time he charged Dakin's fucking skeleton and that went badly. From there, the trailer is punctuated by Scott saying the famous line, To me, my X-Men which is supposed to be the Avengers Assemble of the X-Men franchise, but it is very controversial about whether or not it is. Because it doesn't really become a mainstay of X-Men comics until much more recently than you would expect. So in some ways it's very fitting that it's now being retrofitted into the 90s cartoon, because I don't think it even appears in the original series. And then, finally, after the title card, we get the big reveal of what I was alluding to earlier, the culmination of the entire Trial of Magneto storyline, Magneto taking over Xavier's school. Now in the comics, Charles asks him explicitly to take over right before he fucks off into space, and he does so by assuming the identity of Michael Xavier and pretending to be Charles' cousin. In this version, it seems that Charles has left him the school in his last will and testament, which is extra funny because this version of Magneto, as you can probably tell by the sort of malicious way he says the line, no belongs to me. Is not nearly as reformed as his comic counterpart. I assume we're going to get a very similar story to Trial of Magneto, but a little bit out of order, where this Magneto is given the school and then has to go to the trial to prove that he deserves to keep it. And what's also fun is that when Magneto was the headmaster in the comics, he was mainly presiding over the New Mutants, a younger team, whereas the X-Men had already pretty much gone their own way. But that's sort of the fun of the animated series to begin with. It is this team that has never really been a thing in the comics going through some of the biggest events in X-Men history and I cannot wait to see how they act under Magneto's direction. Let me know what you think and if there's anything I missed or got wrong. I'm sure I did. I'm a fallible human being and please don't forget to like, share, and subscribe.